This episode was sponsored by Girls Can Crate, a subscription box inspiring girls to believe that they can be and do anything. Real women make the best heroes, and every month they deliver them to your front door. Hi, Olivia. Hi, Katie. Here's a question for you. If money were no object, what would you pursue in life? Oh, man. This is the question we ask ourselves at our house all the time. <laughs> I think the honest answer is I would go live on a beach in Spain and not really pursue anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's similar to my answer. Why don't you do that? Why don't you just go live on a beach in Spain? Because I have children who need to go to college. <laughs> But why don't they just go live on a beach in Spain? Yeah, why don't you take them with you? Because we live in reality. (laughs) Because food and somewhere to live and... (laughs) That's the problem. Yeah. I feel like that's where everybody ends up. Yeah. Because money, because reality. It seems like everybody is faced with this. There's your dreams and then there's a good hard reality check. (laughs) It seems like life is navigating between these two poles. What you could dream of, what's possible, and what is realistic. Yeah. Today, I want to tell you about a woman who went full on follow your dreams. (laughs) Her dream was so big, so impossible, that everyone around her Everyone around her was saying, that's never going to happen. I think you better scale back your vision. It's (laughs) like, it's truly impossible. But did she do it? (laughs) She did it. Yay! She did it. Spoiler alert. Yay! (laughs) Happy one. (laughs) Okay. To start us off, though, I want you to describe for me a sculptor. Ooh. They have long hair and they're all renaissance-y and they wear a lot of velvet and (laughs) he has a whole bunch of like minions that are probably teenage children running around fetching tools and stuff and he's staring at a block of marble saying, what's in there? Yeah, like chisel in hand. And he drinks a lot of wine. Right, he does. Red wine. Red wine. Straight out of the bottle probably. Right, and probably doesn't wear shoes very often. Yeah. And I guess he lives in Italy. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, right. So we're we're talking Michelangelo here. Yeah. Or Donatello or yeah. Leonardo, any of the Ninja Turtles. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is quintessential sculptor. Yeah. The sculptor I'm going to tell you about today is Edmonia Lewis. Hmm. Half Native American. Oh. Half African American. Wow. Born in antebellum America, where people of her race were literally enslaved. Whoa. She went on to become a great classical sculptor (laughs) in Rome, (laughs) Italy. What? That was her life. Yeah, that's an impossible (laughs) dream. Yeah. I mean, she's one of those people where if I hadn't seen the actual evidence and and someone like, say, wrote a historical novel about this Native American black woman in the 1800s who goes on to be a classical sculptor in Rome, I'd be like, not real. I mean, that (laughs) did not happen. Yeah. But it did happen. She's amazing. I'm Katie Nelson. And I'm Olivia Mickle. And this is What's Her Name? Fascinating women you've never heard of. So, at Harvard University a few months ago, I visited Charmaine Nelson, who is finishing up a fellowship there. So, I'm Dr. Charmaine Nelson, a professor of art history at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. Okay, let Professor Nelson and I paint you a scene. 1870s Rome. There's a lively community of expats. English speakers from America, Canada, England, living an artistic life there. There's writers, painters, poets. All of them are wealthy. 
All of them are the type of person who can say, I'm just going to move my family to Rome for five years, you know, akin to, yeah, I'll cool. just move to the beach in Spain and just live there. You know, they yes. are the people who can afford to do that. They have the money and yeah. they go, I shall move to Rome. I will rent a large house on the banks of the Tiber River and I will live the life. Novelists like Nathaniel Hawthorne is there, Henry James is there, the famous actress Charlotte Cushman is there, other sculptors like Anne Whitney, uh, Harriet Hosmer, Vinnie Reem Hoxie, they're all, they live there. Mark Twain, mm. Oscar Wilde, Edith Wharton, George Eliot, giants of literature. I want to go there. <laughs> Italy is the place to be. That's where art is found. That's where art is lived. Right. Universally, almost, these are wealthy white people. Imagine you're walking around this English quarter of Rome in the 1870s. There is a particular area where all the sculptors live. And these sculptors hmm. are working at their mad art, you know, red wine in hand, living the life. Right. <laughs> but here too, even among them, they are all wealthy and they are all white. Yeah. But look here. People looked in sometimes to this particular sculptor's studio and they found a brown mixed race woman, you know, cleaning a piece of marble. Excuse me, washerwoman. <laughs> Where is the great sculptor who resides here? Who is he? Mm. They say. And the woman glances at them. You know, maybe she kind of looks at them sideways, rolls her eyes. Here we go again, you know. Yeah. This, she says, is all my own work. This is my studio. I am the sculptor. This woman, this astonishing woman, she was way outside the social norm. She, she wasn't a man, and that's shocking enough. She wasn't wealthy, and she wasn't white. How did she get here? Where did she come from? Well, her story is as unique and interesting as you might expect. So we don't have a firm date of birth. Hmm. So what we, know, what we know of what she told people was that she was born someplace in upstate New York in around 1844. Okay. She was of, of mixed race ancestry. So on the mother's side, she was indigenous. Mm -hmm. And on the father's side, she, was, she had some African ancestry. We, we think it was Caribbean, mm -hmm. African Caribbean. She gets orphaned at a very young age and she ends up with her mother's side of the family. So she's raised amongst indigenous people. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. No. The closest relative besides her mother's family, of which we know very little, is a brother who really gets behind her education and deems it necessary to support her in, in that regard. So he sends her to Oberlin College mm -hmm. in the, the early 1860s. And Oberlin at the time, we believe, is the only college in the USA that's letting in women and letting in people of color. Wow. Yeah, so it's basically the only place she can go. Wow. So she goes to Oberlin, and Oberlin, Ohio was considered an abolitionist setting. So, pretty great. A school that admits women. Yeah. You'd think if she's going to be treated with respect, if she has any chance at equity, this is going to be it. It's going to be here. <laughs> but, no. Yeah. <laughs> she's accused of poisoning two of her roommates with Spanish fly, uh, which is an aphrodisiac. So it's a really bizarre scenario. And then she's brought to trial. Uh, she's defended by a, a man who becomes a very really famous black attorney and politician. John Mercer Langston, I believe his name was, and she gets acquitted. But during the trial, she's actually attacked by a white mob in the dead of winter. She's stripped and she's left for dead outside. 
Sometimes I feel like I haven't got a friend. And she survives that. And of course, there, you know, we have to think about what might have transpired to her really besides a physical assault. She might have been actually sexually violated as well. Right. But that's something in the 19th century no one would have spoken of, right? right? So she recuperates from that. She's acquitted. She tries to re-enroll at Oberlin and they effectively push her out of the school by refusing to allow her to enroll in her classes in the next semester. So they're not brave enough to say, we're expelling you, yeah. right? But they just basically force her out by refusing to let her enroll. And this is where we see the artist emerge. That's the moment we start to see that she's interested in art making because her earliest work that we know of is not, actually not a sculpture. It's a, a sketch, a pencil sketch that she made supposedly as a wedding gift for a friend, for a classmate hmm. of an ancient uh, Greek figure, Urania. So that's the earliest artwork we have from Edmonia Lewis. So there's no future for her here, clearly. Where do you go after this, right? And we have to remember 1862, the Civil War has started. She's 18 years old, about, and she makes her first very bold move. She takes herself to the hub of the abolitionist movement. She moves to Boston, Massachusetts. So in Boston, actually, it seems like she's quite welcomed and embraced. She um, is befriended by people like Lydia Maria Child, who's a wonderful, you know, very strong abolitionist, and also the abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison. And apparently people like this give her, you know, back then it was quite formal, so you needed letters of introduction to people. Yeah. So they presented her with those letters of introduction. She establishes a studio, a sculpting studio, on 89 Tremont Street, which was a very famous set of studio buildings on Tremont Street in Boston. 89 Tremont Street is an amazing address, a crazy place for her to set herself up when she's just this nobody from nowhere, 18 years old, moving hmm. to Boston. It's right on the Freedom Trail. Oh. Uh, the Freedom Trail as we know it today, on the corner of Boston Common, <laughs> right at the site of the Park Street Church, Whoa. which is on the Freedom Trail today because it's the site of from which William Lloyd Garrison, the famous abolitionist, gave all of his famous speeches and sermons. On the steps of the Park Street Church is the place where my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, where that mm. hymn was first sung. And right next to the Park Street Church, is the Granary Burying Ground, mm. where the likes of John Hancock, Sam Adams, James Otis, Robert Treat Payne, and the victims of the Boston Massacre, all those people are buried right there. So it's wow. like the center of liberty in America. Yeah. And when she moved there, it was the height of the abolitionist movement. And she just plops herself in right there and says, I'm here. <laughs> And we understand that a white male sculptor named um, Edward Brackett actually gives her some degree of tutelage and encouragement and some maybe secondhand sculptural tools. So it seems like she doesn't have like rigorous formal training in an art educational setting like most of the white men would be getting, but that she's learning them through people who are sympathetic to her. Somehow, against all odds, she learns to sculpt. <laughs> of all things, a sculptor. And to become a sculptor, you need a specific set of resources. Sculpture was an arduous practice because you make the clay, then you have to transfer it to plaster, then the plaster to marble, and then you gotta get the chisel out. It was like hard physical labor. Sculpture was deemed to be a male art form mm -hmm. because it's just too physically arduous for you young ladies to take this on, blah, 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 like right. go and paint flowers down the hallway, that kind of stuff. Right. And also you needed to know human anatomy, which for proper women was deemed to be inappropriate to study from the nude model and from the cadaver. So how Edmonia inserted herself and became a professionalized artist in this moment when everything was stacked against her, yeah. And when really the world of neoclassical sculpture was for rich, straight white men. Yeah. That's who they thought it was for. So she's making this art and becoming professionalized at a moment when people like her, meaning people who are of African ancestry, are literally still enslaved in the United States. Wow. 
Wow. Yeah, so she ended up in my dissertation, which became my first single authored book, The Color of Stone. In those years of the Civil War in America, interesting things were happening racially. The first company of black soldiers was formed for the Union Army, immortalized in the movie Glory. Mm-hmm. You remember that movie? Starring oh, yes. Denzel Washington, Morgan Freeman. It's an amazing story. Yeah. And their commanding officer, Robert Gould Shaw, who's played by Matthew Broderick in the movie, mm-hmm. he was from Boston. And he died heroically alongside many of his men in battle. And collectively, they were lionized by the people of the North. They were, you know, epic heroes. And Edmonia Lewis is at the center of that abolitionist movement. She's in Boston, where Robert Gould Shaw came from. She must have been deeply affected by this. So she sculpted a bust of Robert Gould Shaw. And that, it turned out, changed the course of her life. This is such an important moment for Lewis because she sells enough copies of this that she raises enough money to buy her boat fare to travel to Italy. And at age 21, she boarded a ship to Italy bound for new horizons. (laughs) So here's a tremendous thing about Lewis too. She becomes, to our knowledge, one of the first people of color to undertake the grand tour, not as a servant or an enslaved person, but as a tourist. Wow. It's so tremendous. So she goes, I think, to London, Liverpool, a couple other places there. And then she crosses over, I think she goes to Paris, and then she, she works her way down into uh, Florence. By the winter of 1866, we know she's in Rome and she's established a studio because journalists who are there, art critics, are reporting on her already at that point because she so stands out it's like right because all the other black people people of color indigenous people would have been there as you know a servant of a rich white household not as someone who dared to establish a studio on on their own yes fast forward 10 years she's a tremendous success on both sides of the atlantic she has european patronage who are the famous the wealthy nobility aristocracy okay So at that point, she comes back to the Philadelphia Exposition. She's invited back to show two of her works that become two of her most famous works. And she's actually preparing, she's installing her sculpture, and someone asks her if she's cleaning it. So can you imagine, she must have been just barraged with that her whole life. Like, what do people see when they look at her? Even in the midst of preparing her sculpture, she couldn't possibly be be the artist. She has to be the cleaner. So it's like the impossibility of her body in that role was multiplied even than that which her white female peers obviously would have experienced. And now let's pause for a word from our sponsor. Girls Can Crate is an awesome subscription box that introduces girls age 5 to 10 to real, fearless women who made the world better. Every crate features an inspiring woman, a 28-page activity book, plus everything you would need to complete two or three hands-on STEAM activities and more. And if you're on a budget, they have mini crates too. Real women make the best heroes, and every month, Girls Can Crate delivers them. For What's Her Name podcast listeners, we have a special discount code for you. You'll get 20% off your first month's crate, any subscription that you order. Girls Can Crate, C-R-A-T-E dot com, and use the code HERNAME to get 20% off. Even 10 years on, when she proved she could do it, the people around her, they're not a supportive community. This isn't like a happy artist's commune where everybody's supporting each other. Even her friends, they're really... (laughs) Frenemies. Yeah, condescending frenemies. Hmm. But Edmoni was deemed to be one of this group of about 10 female, mainly sculptors, a few painters, Um, who had studios and practices based at Rome, who came to be known as the White Marmorian Flock, which was a really dubious and and, um, insulting label attached to them by the novelist Henry James. So that's when people call this group of women the flock, as if they were a group. They weren't a group, right? Henry James imposed this label on them to minimize them, like White Marmorian Flock, meaning Marmorian means marble-like. 
So the joke was, marble birds can't fly. If you're a bird made of stone, you fall from the sky. Mm -hmm. So this was a joke on them, right? But to say that they were a group is also totally false. What they were is like this loose network of women, some of whom were friends, some of whom were not, mm -hmm. who get lumped together. It's not like they shared an aesthetic and mm -hmm. decided, let's go this way together, ladies, let's paint this, no. Mm -hmm. They get lumped together by him. And this is the thing too, they were very arrogant, a lot of them, people like Story and that would, they'd be very dismissive of people like Lewis, first of all, because they were racist, let's put, put it blind, even those of, those of them who thought themselves to be abolitionists, mm -hmm. still had a lot of racist antagonism towards people of color. Mm -hmm. And the other part was that they thought they were better than those who had to sell their art, because like, well, look at me, I'm just governed by inspiration. Uh -huh. Oh, you're governed by inspiration because your daddy is, is a judge yeah. who's funding you. So you make what you want, you don't have to sell it. Mm -hmm. But there's other people amongst you who actually have to sell to eat. Mm -hmm. But they look down upon that, right? right. So the classism of that, yeah. and of course since racism is inflected with classism, right? Because there's an assumption that the indigenous person, the black person, the person of color is always already the lower class, which right. is not always true. Right. But then you're held in that position by those who don't want you to be able to aspire to other class positions. Mm -hmm. So she was constantly confronted by that, and we know that actually when you have a dream, often then you have someone you can look to and go, well, that person did that, that person, I'm gonna pattern myself on this person. Yeah. She has no one. She has people who completely don't look like her, who don't share her experience of the world, many of whom are telling her not to do it. Mm -hmm. Even her so-called friends, like Lydia Marie Child, who before I, I wrote about her, often people would write about friends like Lydia Marie Child as if there was no complexity in that relationship because oh, of course Lydia Marie Child is an abolitionist so of course everything would have been hunky-dory between them mm -hmm. and when you, I dig into the correspondence and there's a lot because Lydia was really good friends for instance with Robert Gould Shaw's parents okay. so here's a scenario Robert Gould Shaw is martyred then he dies in the battle Edmonia wants to sculpt him she goes to Lydia and tells her Lydia discourages her and says, no, you're not a good enough artist to do this. So like, don't wreck him, right? right. Basically the thing. Right. And so Edmonia just says, no, I'm going to do this. So she goes for it anyway. She does it. And then when she's successful, she sells all these busts. She makes enough money. She goes to Lydia's house to say goodbye. And she sees that Lydia has photos of Robert. And she says, why did you never lend those to me? Huh. And it was deliberate because then you see Lydia's correspondence with Shaw's mother, and she's actually saying that she's discouraging Edmonia from doing this and that mm -hmm. she shouldn't do it. So this is all going on behind the scenes, mm -hmm. where in public they're just like, Edmonia's great and we're supporting her and she has great potential, mm -hmm. but behind the scenes there's all this stuff going on. Right. Right. And then when Edmonia gets to Europe, Lydia's writing to people saying, I told her not to think that she can be an original artist but she, what she should focus on is just making copies and selling them to tourists. So like she has, she thought she had no, as they'd say in the day, original genius. Right. So if Edmonia had listened to these people who were supposedly her greatest friends and advocates, we wouldn't have had this great art from her because she dared to, to think that she was good enough to be you know, an original artist, and she was, right? So this is the kind of thing. So thank goodness though for these archives or we'd never know all the kind of you know, behind the scenes dialogue that was going on. And I have to say this world of the expats and those who stayed behind in, in America, they were so gossipy and backbiting and mm. infighting. It was not a pleasant world. Mm. They were like on the surface, I guess, pretended to be friendly and behind the scenes, they were really at each other. And just like, you don't quite have the potential to be like us. So then be your best, which is lower than like less yeah. than us kind of thing. So yeah. thankfully she just was like, boop. <laughs> she just had this, I get such a powerful sense of self and what she was capable of that she didn't allow people to deter her. There was no one in front of her who was the ideal or the paradigm that she could say, I'm going to do this like that person. Yeah. Like she was a first male or female of color to become a professional sculptor and, and you know, become successful and have an international reputation. Yeah. The first. So there was nobody in front of her uh, to, to look at a role model. Okay, so neoclassical sculpture 
Just making sure that I'm thinking about this right. This is mm -hmm. carving out of marble. Right, out of marble. Huge sculptures, sometimes larger than life. And these are like Greek gods and idealized people and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're reviving ancient Greek and Roman sculpture. They're looking back at Michelangelo, who also revived ancient Greek and Roman sculpture. Right. And they're doing that kind of thing. Yeah, the, the process of creating the final product, which is marble, right. is long, arduous, difficult, and it requires great strength which is yeah. one of the reasons why people said women can't do that. You know, you right. got to have biceps to be able to do that. <laughs> Neoclassicism was not an individual process of production. So why you'd go to Rome and set up a studio is because it was deemed necessary to have a team of artisans. Because again, the whole process was um, about four or five different stages. So first, usually you'd make a sketch, then you do the clay, um, maquette, then you transfer it to plaster, then you transfer it to marble, then you chisel, 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 right? Mm -hmm. So you needed artisans, needed, right? Mm -hmm. To be working on, like you do the first two stages, you hand it over to them and they finish the works and then you put the finishing touches. Mm -hmm. So someone who's really professional, you're working on multiple things at once, your studio artisans are finishing things for all your different patrons. Okay. So you could have a, like teams of people working for you. The thing is though that we know for sure that people like Lewis and Emma Stebbins in the 1850s they heard about uh, Harriet Hosmer was accused of fraud. Harriet and all the women did the practice just like the men which is usually you work the hardest on the sketch and on the maquette and then you hand it off to the artisans and you put the finishing touches on your sculpture. Mm -hmm. Okay but they accused her of letting her artisans finish the work too much mm. okay which is something probably that all of them were doing too meaning all of them the white male artists yeah. but of course you're going to level that attack at the woman because she can't possibly make art that, that is that good so we know then from the correspondence that emma stebbins and lewis they just like fire everybody or don't hire anybody and they just start doing all the whole process themselves because they're so terrified of being accused of fraud wow. so then lewis's output mm -hmm. is way less than her white male contemporaries. Right. But she did that to protect herself because who are you gonna accuse? The person of color and the woman, and she's both. The good news is by 1876, despite all of this, she has come into her own. She is a master. Yay! For the neoclassicist, what's at the center is the human body. And what's even better is the unclothed human body because that's how you show your chops as an artist. Like mm -hmm. I know human anatomy. Mm -hmm. And again, that's what the women are left out of and that's what the people of color are left out of. We won't let you train from the nude, right? You can't get, literally can't get into life drawing classes in this part of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. So if the white man has a cast of the entire human body, it's just normal. You're a sculptor, what you should know is the body. Right. Right? But if a woman does it, it's inappropriate and sexually inappropriate. Right. And the other way to get this training was from the cadaver in med school. Again, who's getting into med school in yeah. the 19th century? Right. So what the white women do, like we know for sure um, Harriet Hosmer and Emma Stebbins accessed training through med school through their family connections because they're wealthy. So Harriet Hosmer would literally go to the campus of the college and study at night after hours with the professor. But how is Monia going to get this? Right. So literally, she had to learn human anatomy on her own, which how did she teach herself that? Absent all those, the, the normative training that was extended to her peers or even the, the clandestine training then that was extended to white women. Yeah. It's remarkable. Here's the thing. Neoclassical sculpture was art for morality's sake. All these people are invested in, I'm telling a narrative that has to have a moral. It's not art for art's sake. That's the modernists. This is art for morality's sake. Mm. So then the narrative was everything. Mm. And so you had failed with your sculpture if you did not give enough detail in the rendering, in the materiality, in the, in the aesthetic to allow your viewers access to the correct narrative. The sculpture is very different from a painting, right? Because a painting allows you to create the narrative within a two-dimensional world that you might simulate to be three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. With a sculpture, what's different is if you're relying mainly on one human body, that human figure and what they're wearing and where they are has to tell this whole story. Mm 
-hmm. right? But you don't have this whole context that you can create. You just have the body. So how do you tell a story, mm -hmm. right? So for instance, if they're in the forest, you might show a tree stump at their foot yeah. or a flower at their foot, right? Yeah. Or if they're still enslaved, you show a shackle on their hand. If they're newly freed, this, you break the shackle, mm -hmm. right? So all these little things are telling the audience, this is the moment of the narrative. So for instance, Eve, mm. the difference between Eve before the fall and after, right? So is she looking at the apple, contemplating it? Is she uh, unclothed? And is she ashamed of being unclothed, right? Mm -hmm. So just those little things can tell you what moment in the biblical narrative it is. Yeah. So same thing with Cleopatra. Is she dead? Is she thinking about killing herself? Is the snake actually on her body mm -hmm. already, right? So wh where is it in the narrative of her killing herself, mm. right? So yeah. all of that has to be, though, just through a very limited register of contextual markers yeah. that are really uh, restricted compared to what you can do in a painting. She sculpts her two greatest and most famous pieces. Hmm. Two larger-than-life marble sculptures, one of Hagar and one of Cleopatra. Hmm. Two famous figures from antiquity. Yeah. Two women of color. Yeah. She's commenting on race in the 1870s using these figures from the deep past. Wow. Sculpting Cleopatra had become a thing. So William Wetmore's story, a bunch of other neoclassicists sculpted Cleopatra. Why? Cleopatra in the period was a stand-in for the black diaspora. Because oh. she was taken as an Egyptian queen, meaning an African queen, meaning her body can stand symbolically for black people. Okay. okay, so to show her dying too is to show the tragedy of the oppression of slavery. Mm -hmm. So she became a stand-in, right? So whereas a lot of other people like Story sculpted Cleopatra contemplating suicide. So she'd have the snake nearby or she'd be brooding, like, you know. What Lewis does is she sculpts her already dead. Okay, and she sculpts her in the period of the, the, what's called reconstruction, which, which for black people and abolitionists was a failure. You know, the civil war is won by the North. The enslaved people are freed and they're not fully citizen because again, the state rises up with all these segregationist tactics, can't vote, can't be in public office, and then white mob rules too starts to uh, you know terrorize people with things like lynching. Yeah. So it's a mess. The promise of freedom emancipation didn't look like what it was supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. So here, if you're gonna solve the black queen in reconstruction as a, as a black and indigenous woman, she's not contemplating death, she's just dead, yeah. right? So she's like in, when she's sitting in the throne, her head is like thrown back to the side and her arm is like over the side of the throne. And for the people at that moment, they thought this was graphic, a graphic portrayal of death. So people like aesthetically, like there's actually really good writing at the time, art criticism, where they're saying this woman is innovating on the aesthetic level. Like this is no longer neoclassicism. Right, because neoclassicism was very stoic and very stiff and very, yeah. everybody was like, you know? Yeah. And this was not that. So that is something too that I think a lot of people overlook, that she did something really innovative with those, those later works. Wow. Yeah. That's, ooh, cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Do these still exist? Like, can I see that? Yep, we'll okay. post pictures on the website and on our social media accounts. Cool. After this, after 1876, she produced her two great works, our records go completely dark. Her life is completely unknown. We don't have the sources because, because well, nobody kept them. Nobody mm. saved them. Other sculptors who lived in Rome at the time had somebody in their life that was actively preserving all their letters, all their stuff, right. you know, like getting ready to write their biography, but she didn't have anybody. Ugh. There is that gap then between the last most famous sculptures in 76, 1876 and her death. And then so as scholars were thinking, how much more work did she produce that we haven't found yet? There's a bunch of people who probably have her work who maybe know or maybe don't know. So I think there might be more out there that's really, again, yeah. in that vein, very innovative. Wow. Yeah. Professor Nelson had searched all over Italy for her grave, thinking she's got to be in Rome. She's got to be, yeah. you know, she's got to be there somewhere, but she found her nowhere. Um, but another scholar located her, found her buried in London. So we know she ended Whoa. up in London 
and died in 1907. But that's all wow. we know. What were the final three decades of her life like? Did she keep making art? Whoa. You know, maybe she made lots of stuff and it has yet to be discovered. Maybe it's in people's attics, you know, or in people's yeah. private collections and they don't know actually what they have. Yeah. Or maybe she stopped sculpting altogether because Whoa. neoclassical style fell oh, deeply out. out of fashion. So neoclassicism becomes passé, mm -hmm. here comes Rodin and the modernists, and everything shifts from Rome to Paris. One other tidbit that Professor Nelson has discovered was that she converted to Catholicism. She was buried in a Catholic cemetery in London. Mm. And, and to me, that's just that's so fitting with what we know of the rest of her life. You can't put her in any box. Yeah. She doesn't fit anywhere. Because if she were deeply rooted in the abolitionist community of Boston, you know, they are like hardcore Protestant. Right. And off she goes to Catholic Rome and converts to Roman Catholicism of all right. things. You know, well, she and, just... and coming out of a Native American upbringing. Wow. Yeah, she defies all categorization. Brilliant, tenacious, stubborn. I think this is a power of Edmonia too. How do you have a vision of yourself that precedes a vision of someone like you, whoever existed in the world? Because mm -hmm. most of us can't do it. Yeah. Most of us is like, I need the role model, give me the role model, and then I can try to follow the role model, and even that will fail at. Mm -hmm. But she like projects out ahead of anything. Like she's the first of the first of the first. No one thought she was supposed to make it in this world, you know? Yeah, it's just, she wasn't, she wasn't supposed to be possible. If you'd like to learn more about Edmonia Lewis or see pictures of her sculptures, head to our website, whatshernamepodcast.com. Special thanks to Charmaine Nelson, whose book The Color of Stone and other works you can also find on our website. Music for this episode was recorded by the brilliant Dana Boulay, and antique recordings of Motherless Child and My Country Tis of Thee can be found at the Library of Congress Folk Music Collection. Our theme song was composed and performed by Daniel Foster Smith, you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, where we post lots of pictures each week. We are so grateful for the support of all of our sponsors. You can become one for as little as a buck a month and help make more episodes happen. Special shout out to Chantel Oliver, Catherine McKay, and Dorothy Merrill. Thanks for donating. Thanks for listening. Hello, What's Her Name listeners. I'm Barry Max Day. And I'm Ben Vandeveld. And we'd love you to listen to Worst Foot Forward, our podcast all about failure. Each week, we are joined by a guest to discuss the world's worst something, from serial killer to monarch, sex scene to mythical creature. And along the way, we've discovered things like murderous game show contestants, pirates who plundered hats, February 30th, seagull wine, and the great detective, Herlock Sholmes. Subscribe to Worst Foot Forward on iTunes, Spotify, CastBox, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Check out our website, worstfootforwardpodcast.com and join us for some fun-filled zero worship.